Welcome, Dr. Edwin Bryant, for another little chat at uh, Keen on Yoga. This time, we're going to be discussing the Bhagavad Gita. We're going to try and do it in a record pace and roughly, to short to Edwin's chagrin, in roughly 45 minutes. Right. So, um, first of all, let's, let, you know, let's, let's try and wade in there with some context. Like, what, what is this volume and how does it relate to other, vol uh, other texts around it? Uh, the, the, the Bhagavad Gita. Um... It's important to note that because there's a lot of martial language in it and sort of warrior kind of uh, exhortations. It's important mm. to note that it, it's part of the a great the biggest epic, uh, literary epic in existence called the Mahabharata, which is 100,000 verses. And it's about the great sort of fratricidal war between two groups of cousins. So the Gita's smack in the middle of that. So it takes place right in the right as the battle is about to begin. So that's why you're going to find, uh, you know, Krishna telling Arjuna to fight, to fight, to fight. This is not the Yoga Sutras. Mm. So um, the first chapter of the Gita then is on the battlefield. It's identifying the warriors. Important to know that because when I remember when I, you know, was 19 or something, and I'd heard about, you know, I was uh, discussed the, the other day on a spiritual quest, and I and I'd heard about the Gita as being an important spiritual text. And I found a copy and I, and I read the first chapter and I, and I discarded it. I said, what kind of a spiritual text is this? this is a bunch of warriors. Me it's too, like, me too. Yeah, more like something you'd find in the, you know, in, in, in Aeid or something. So, um, <laughs> uh, yeah. Exactly. So it is part of the Mahabharata, but then at some point, it's not clear when, it gets plucked out of the, it, certainly by Shankara's time in the eighth century, but it must have been before that, because Shankara's is the first commentary, along with actually there were two at that time. There was Shankara and the, another, uh, I forget the name, uh, it'll come to me, another Basha, we have half of it. So, so eighth, ninth century, at that point, it's a standalone text, but we don't know exactly when it was extracted from the Mahabharata. So at that point, Shankara's writing a commentary on the Gita. And it becomes part of the Vedanta, the three texts that are central to Vedanta. They call the Prasthana Triya. So that would be the Upanishads himself, which are the, the, the canonical texts. Then the Vedanta Sutra, which is sort of a, a exegesis on the Upanishads. And then the Gita, these become the three texts. Mm. That, and then the, the various Vedanta commentators then write their commentaries on these three. And, they, and then you get the Advaita and Vishishta Advaita and Dwaita and the various schools. Right. So the Gita then, in its own right, prior to being plucked out, is a discourse um, on, on the battlefield. And, and it's what triggers the Gita. It's not an existential sort of question, like, you know, who am I? And, you know, what is, why, you know, what is, the, you know, what is reality? And why is there something and not nothing? And what happens after death? It's none of those big ticket existential uh, questions which trigger the teachings. Arjun is confused, not about his existential self but about his dharma because mm -hmm. he has a, a kind of finds himself in a situation where there's two conflicting dharmas on the one hand his grandfather his guru or on the other side just by the quirks of protocol not because of any animosity nothing like that just because of the quirks of, of warrior you know the dharmic quirk, you know requirements of the day they found themselves on the other side so their grandfather who was really more like their father figure because the pandavas were orphans so the central kind of father figure in their life was great Bhishma, right? Technically, biologically, a grand uncle, but, 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 in, but in sort of in familial terms, he was the father figure. And the guru, Drona. So we all know how revered grandfathers and gurus are, well, certainly in India, but, you know, maybe even a little bit in the West <laughs> still, oh, right? Yeah, yeah. A bit of respect, so, yeah, yeah. so lingers perhaps. Yeah. So they're on the other side. So he, he, you know, he's a Maharati. He has to protect his army. He's the one of the commander in chief. And that means he has to protect him against, these are the greatest Maharati, great charioteers, Maharati, Bhishma and Drona. So that means he's gonna to have to take them out in order to protect his, his army, you know, and bring his boys home, bring the lads home to their mums, right? He's gonna to have to take out Bhishma and Drona. So on the one hand, that's one, set, one calling, one Dharmic calling. On the other hand, as he says, Pujarho, they're worthy of puja, they're worthy of worship. It's my, so he doesn't know what to do. And, he, and he's so conflicted, dharma samuda chetaha, that's what he says. My mind is confused about dharma, not about big ticket, you know, yogic Vedanta questions. Dharma samuda chetaha. 
Shishaste ham shadi mam tvam prapanam. I don't know what to do. Tell me what to do. I'm now your, your disciple, right? Up to then, they were equals. They were cousins in a sort of, in the Leela, right? Mm -hmm. So then the Gita starts, the actual Gita starts around 211. And um, so, uh, so then Krishna then, so, but the, the point is he's confused about his Dharma and, uh, and then the text is going to focus on Dharma. So the Gita then, uh, I'm sorry, next time remind me to take it. Don't worry it. about it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. distracting you, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I may, may I just say, if you, if you like, or unless you want to interject. Um, well, the Dharma, I mean, I suppose like the chapter two, it does immediately get into the big existential stuff, right? I mean, because, yeah, the chapter one is like, well, what do I do? I'm in between, he sinks down between the two battles. He doesn't know what to do anymore, right? You know, and obviously, luckily, his best mate is happens to be God, kind of a fortunate situation, you know. But, but chapter two is straight away, you know, Krishna says, these people have never existed, you know, have never not existed. Will they, then they will, will never not exist, you know, like they are not slain, right, etc. You know, so he gives this pretty radical philosophy straight away, right, which is existential. And, and does, I suppose my question is always, can someone take on the ideas of the Bhagavad Gita without also, or even yoga as a darshan, as a viewpoint, without taking on karma and reincarnation? And that's a bigger question, I suppose, I'll throw yeah. out there generally. All yoga is predicated on jnana yoga. Mm. So any other kind of yoga, whether it's Patanjalian, whether it's Bhakti, whether it, it, the, 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 the sort of the foundation is that I'm not the body mind, I'm Atman. That's mm. Jnana Yoga. So before taking Arjuna where he wants to take him in terms of action in the world, he has to first establish you are an Atman. Right. Sanatana Dharma is here. Jnana yeah. Yoga. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, you can take that Jnana Yoga in two different ways in the Gita. Into a, a place of inaction, which is Patanjalian type yoga. Or a place of action, right? The Gita talks about two action, two yogas, <laughs> not four. This idea of four yogas is, is Vivekananda at the end of the 19th century. The Gita never talks mm. about four yogas, mm. talks about two. There's the Sankhya yoga of the jnana, which is synonymous with jnana. And then there's yoga, and the Gita calls yoga karma yoga, samatvam yoga uchate, karma kaushalam yogam uchate, that yoga is skill in action. So it, it doesn't give the same definition of yoga as Patanjali does. Okay, so let's back up a minute. So, so you have jnana yoga. That means I'm an Atman. And up until that point, those who were really interested in the Atman went to the forest. They did inaction yoga. In chapter two and the beginning of three and beginning of five, Krishna says there were two kinds of yoga. One got lost, yoga nashta parantam, parantapa. They were, so the only one that was around at the time is inaction yoga. Right. That's what mm -hmm. we see in the Puranas. That was what we see in the Mahabharata Moksha Dharma, even the Shveta Shvatara. Those who were doing yoga, yoga were in a, in, a, in a forest or in a cave or in a, in a place where they can be inactive or minimalistic, in, 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 you, know, you know, maximally minimalistic in their, in their activities. Krishna says, yes, but there was another kind that I taught in the beginning to the, you know, the beginning of creation. Right. You know, you know, you know, and it was handed down, and then in the course of great time, he got lost. The action yoga, he says, now I'm coming to reestablish it. So, so the Gita is really honoring mm. the inaction yoga. It honors it, doesn't reject mm -hmm. it. Chapter five and six is, is, is sort of, you know, chapter six is the, is the Tanjali in yoga. But he says, of the two, Arjuna, action yoga is better. He comes right out and says that. I think it's in chapter five. They say, but he says the opposite later as well, though, doesn't he? He says, they, then he will say renunciation is better than action. In another chapter, he constantly contradicts himself if I'm, you're not reading oh. it incorrectly. Well, well, yeah, but then he defines what renunciation is. Right. The renunciation in chapter five is not renouncing the work, but renouncing the attachment to the fruit. He says reaction, that which yeah. they call that which they call sannyasi, sannyasa arjuna, tadvidhi yogam. Know that to be yoga, meaning action yoga. So it's not that it's a contradiction. It's just that we think when we think of renunciation, we're still in that number one kind of yoga mindset. Right. Renunciation means leaving the world and going in the in the forest. The whole, but and even arjuna gets confused twice. 
the beginning of chapter three beginning tell me which is better what, yeah, 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 better. yeah 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 he yeah, says exactly yeah. what you said yeah you're yeah, yeah. Confusing yourself you're saying you know you're saying this and you're saying that Just yeah, tell yeah. Me what am i supposed to do tell you what to do and the yeah. problem is because we are thinking of renunci he, he was thinking of renunciation as absolute renunciation of everything and krishna keeps repeating it's not the action that you have to renounce renunciation is attachment to the fruit of action um and so that's and it takes a while to really he keeps repeating it and and we also after two millennia <laughs> we're also like hang on a minute what are you saying this over here and that over there so it's renounce it so it's really the gita is promoting a new kind of yoga based can but i just can i throw that phone out in, a, in the other room for a minute yeah sure yeah yeah. yeah we can edit that yeah we can edit this out mm -hmm. So can we take it the, the, the thrust of the text or the reason? I mean, what's the reason for the text? Like Patanjali, we say, you know, was writing, you know, as uh, uh, to defend uh, yoga or, or Samkhya against Buddhism, against the threat of Buddhism. And are we looking at Bhagavad Gita as trying to bring back the idea of worldly people in the world as opposed to all these people leaving the world, which is a bit of a problem, you know, for, for society? You know, what's the yeah, thrust would, of the text? I would just push back a little bit on that. Sure. Really is, you know, he does engage Buddhism in the fourth chapter as an afterthought. I wouldn't say that he's it's his primary motive. I would say I, for me, Patanjali is systematizing all these. What's come before? Yeah. You know, there's so many different strands. And that's what mm. that's what the entire sutra tradition does, not just Patanjali. Yeah. They come to the tail end of the Upanishads. And it is true there's a threat of Buddhism that's challenging the you know, the, the sort of ultimacy of the Atman, right? Because Buddhism will have a temporary momentary Atman. Um, and I would also push, and, and there are, and there are, and there are, oh, I shouldn't articles, have mentioned this. <laughs> there are these articles that say that the Gita is a call back to civic order because everyone's run, up, run off to the forest. Yeah. I find that such a silly, a silly. Do uh, you? Right, right, right. Because, but like, also, everybody's going off to the forest. Of course they're not. <laughs> the vast majority of people are doing Vedic ritual. In the in the in the in the social you know in town. So it, it, is it a push? I right. Read, I, I, can't, I haven't read it. Is yet. it was it a pushback against kind of decadent Brahmanism then? You know, on, on well, one hand, or on the other hand, it, it's also very. It seems quite conservative. And chapter seventeen, you've got like this this kind of strongly laid out idea. Like this is what the Kshatriyas do. This is what the Brahmins do. Right. You know, and keep your caste. Is it is it you know a kind of a like a, a text of the establishment? Well, it's a busy text, and it is yes, yeah, conservative. Krishna says, "I established Varanashram in the I in the beginning," and he is, and he accepts the Vedic sacrifice. He says, "In the beginning, this was given, you know, to you know, you you is like it's your milk fulfilling cow." So what yeah. I see, the, the Gita's got multiple things going on. Number one, it's it's it, you know, the, just yoga, which had become exclusively the forest yoga. Krishna says, "Well, that's true, that's there, but there were two kinds, and one got lost." So Gita is re-establishing the karma yoga, but not because everyone's running off the forest. Hey, yeah, that, come on, think about the yeah. logistics of that. That's tough. True enough. <laughs> but um, but, uh, but um, so to establish that, and secondly, it's it's a, you know the, a strong theistic. Not not you know the whole text is kind of you know over the, the overarching one of the overarching agendas of the Gita is Krishna saying, "I am God." and surrender to me and devotion is the highest and you know and that takes over the second half of the text in it, it, with full force so it's a it's a it's a v extremely strong it, it, you know monotheistic uh, statement so you have the emergence of a, a form of yoga that's action yoga that you know that is re being re-established by the Gita Yes, you do have an undermining of Vedic ritualism, but not the actual ritual, but the attachment to the fruits. Right. Because mm. Vedic ritualism, yeah. um, you know, everybody was doing all these rituals because they wanted this, they wanted that. Then Krishna's saying, you can do that in a yogic way, you keep doing the ritual. He's not, he doesn't undermine the idea that no. the ritual perpetuates the cosmos. He doesn't undermine that. Mm. In fact, he says, yes, the ritual does perpetuate yeah. the cosmos. So he's keeping that, it's orthodox, yeah. But it's a it, it's a it's sort of a yogic uh, a yogic kind of way of of thinking about that orthodox culture. He's not undermining the social systems, not even the Bhagavatam, not even Bhakti. 
He says where well, women can attain the highest goal, sudras can attain the highest goal, the, you know, sudurachara, even if you're the worst kind of behavior. You, but he's not undermining the caste system. Mm, mm, mm. Just saying that bhakti is accessible to everybody, yoga is accessible to everybody, karma yoga is accessible. So in that sense, it's kind of drastic. But the actual social order remains the social order. Vedic ritualism remains Vedic ritualism, provided you do it without attachment to the fruits. So it's, in one sense, it's very, very innovative, but at the same time, it's innovating within the, hmm. the normative social stru structures of its time. So I see the Gita as A, introducing an action in the world yoga, and B, then taking that action in the world up to the, its highest expression, which is bhakti, and establishing a strong monotheistic, like, I am, I am the Ishvara, Maheshwara, you know, Bhuktaram Yagnatapasam, Sarvaloka Maheshwara, extremely strong, kind of in your face, if you will, but extremely strong monotheistic statement. Uh, and then the goal of it, you know, if you look, actually, we counted once, out of eight, 18 chapters, whatever the content of the chapter is, fifth, uh, 15 or 13 of those 18 end with a statement about either bhakti is the highest or Krishna is the highest end with that bhakti statement. And we know from, you know, the, the, the exegesis, Vedanta exegesis, opening, concluding statements are the most important. So right. always makes this point of at the end of the chapter, even though it seems like it was talking about this, that, and the other, comes back to, you know, yoginam apisarvesham madgatein antaratmanam of all yogis, the one who surrenders to me is the best comes back to some kind of a bhakti slash monotheistic statement. Mm. You mentioned at the start that there was two kinds of yogas and you said yeah. jnana, jnana and uh, karma, right? But but also, I mean, we don't, we have, I mean, we have, you were talking about bhakti there. So I mean, there's a strong injunction for bhakti. There's yeah. also a lot of uh, kind of, could we say kind of like, can we call it raj yoga, like meditational ideas, like focus on me. If you can't do anything else, concentrate on me, uh, you know, right. There's, you know, and there's also a, a lot of hatha yoga. I mean, there is a number of passages where he says, you know, sitting in a, on your kusha grass with spina rex, right. You know, like breathing in and out through the nose. I mean, there's a lot of, you know, asana based methodology there as well. If you look for it. Right. So, yeah, I, I think the, we, it's a question of categories here. Let's just right. stick. With, let's stick with the two kinds of yoga that Krishna himself in the Gita. Because we're talking about the Gita here, right? So the Gita itself, in the beginning of chapter two, and the beginning of three, and the beginning of five, and we can pull those verses out if we want. Two kinds of yoga. So there's the yoga of the yoga. There is the jnana yoga sankhyanam. There's the jnana yoga of the sankhya people. Patanjali is part of that. Patanjali asana is sankhya. And is jnana, and that and that jnana can take two, that can be subdivided again into really chitta vritti naroda, her kind of, which you see in chapter six, and a more kind of jnana, or kind of a dwaita style jnana, where you don't really chitta vritti naroda, her, but you're as inactive as you can be, and you're you know you're contemplating the you know the the Upanishadic truth. So let's just call, call all of that jnana yoga slash sankhya yoga, and that in Patanjali is a part of that. Inaction is the focus. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Action yoga can take a karma yoga sort of uh, expression, which is you duty for duty's sake with no attachment. But mm -hmm. then it's clear that the highest form of that action yoga is bhakti. Right. It's okay, offering so a part of karma. Yeah, well, it's, a, it's, a highest, it's the highest, highest karma. Right. karma. Yat karoshi, yadashnashi, yad johosi. Whatever you do, do it, offer it to me. Now, now the, okay, the boundary is a little bit porous, as you say, because even if you do inaction yoga, you can still fix your mind on Bhagavan and do that. So that can still be bhakti. So bhakti kind of, you know, so really action, inaction, bhakti transcends that because you mm. can do bhakti in an active type of way, puja, offer everything, do your duty, offer it up. Or you can do bhakti in a sedentary chitta vritti nirodha sort of way, which is what he says at the end of chapter six. Chapter six is all in action yoga, Patanjali yoga. And at the end, he says, oh, and all these yogis, the one who fixes his mind on me is the highest. So, but let's, so we have to, bhakti transcends those categories. But underneath those, underneath you have an inaction and action type of, you know, of uh, bifurcation. 
e even though the inaction is has different modalities, the Gita itself talks about two yogas. And, and look, read chapter four to be clear about that. And chapter five, uh, beginning of chapter three, I mean, your listeners, I mean, beginning of chapter three. <laughs> Me as well. I'm just trying, I'm trying. What, what about, I mean, I don't, I, 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 chapter 18 is really, I mean, that's the, if we, if we call that the end finale, right? And it's important, right? Because it's conclusive. It's really going back to the, the idea of the gunas, right? You know, and and this idea that everyone has moved like a puppet, like, right? you know, I mean, he talks about this a lot, you know, let the gunas play with the gunas. The wise man knows that the, you know, that they do nothing, that the gunas are everything, right? I mean, there's a, there's a great deal of still kind of Samkir-esque talk on the importance of understanding the role yeah. of the gunas, right? Well, that's the, the first half of the chapter. And once he's done all of that Gornick talk, then he says, listen to again. me one last yeah. time. Yeah. <laughs> Devote to me. Yeah. Yeah. One yeah. last yeah. time, yeah. I'll yeah. sum it all up. I've done all of his 17 chapters. Yeah. Here's my grand finale teaching. Man mana bhava mad bhakto, mad yajit. Fix your mind on me. Surrender to me. And he says it three times. By my grace, by my grace, by my grace, you will attain the highest destination. And it ends up with sarva dharma paricca. Give up, even give up all dharma. Mam ikam sharanam braja, surrender to me. That's the last instruction. And then he says, Arjuna, have you heard? Did you get it? Arjuna says, yes, yes, yes. And then we're back in the Mahabharata. So you need, so the, it's very true. The first 30, 40 verses of Gunas, but, but then he, you know, so he's going over that again. And then he says, okay, now I'm going to sum it all up, Arjuna, and listen to my final word, my grand finale conclusion. I'm summarizing, and it's exclusively bhakti. And so, mm. yeah, so go to verse like 50, 40, you know, late 40s, 50, and then right up into the, you know, the famous 1866, we give up everything to, to me, including your Dharma, right? You just spent 18 chapters talking about Dharma, 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 and at the end he says, mm. well, even that up and surrender to me. Yeah, yeah. That's the ultimate message of the Gita, Adam. Sort of verse 50 something to 66. Has it, what's its impact, I suppose, on... Not, I suppose, but what's it? What's it been? Its impact on the population of India, right? I mean, as, as a as a foundational text, it seems to be at the heart of the spiritual perspective we find in India. And people have said, uh, you know, I've read arguments saying that really it's encouraged a kind of deterministic, fatalistic attitude, or or it was, or it was put out there by, say, colonial powers to encourage a rather passive idea that you know you couldn't do anything, that you know, like you know, the gunas were at play, right? You're only puppets, right? On the other hand, you've got a dynamic Arjuna who's a warrior, so that's not quite correct. Um, how, how do the two, um, what, what are your feelings about that? Well, you know, all this, remember, people that will make these kinds of comments, if they don't believe in an Atman or a Bhagavan or any kind of moksha or possibility, for them, it's all a human construct, right? And they, for them, it, it, and therefore you're looking at power, it, back to what we discussed before, mm -hmm. Marxist and post-Marxist kind of interpretations. What's going on here? Why the British, you know, who's, who's, who's controlling, who's projecting power where? So that just reflects a, 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 a starting premise. If you're a materialist, you're going to think like that, if, you know. But um, it, if the question is, in the tradition, the What's been the influence of the text, I suppose? Yes, okay. in your in your mind, yes. Before the modern period, it you know it wasn't quite it wasn't like the so called you know the main canonical text of India. It was kind of a Vedanta text. You know, it was read, but not universally, not in the way it is now. Uh, I think it is true to say that when the British came to India, I don't know, maybe it started with the Portuguese. I, you know, that that, that little mm. interesting you know work to be done on the Portuguese still. But let's go mm. with the British. Um, because you you know they came in the 16th century. Mm, mm, mm. That's another story. Yeah. The right. British, you know, yeah. their <laughs> their idea of religion is one book, one prophet, yeah. or in the case of Judaism, a bunch of prophets, right? Islam, right? One book, one character, Jesus Christ, Muhammad, or in the case of Je yeah, and one God, right? So they go to works India, then. What, yeah. What, what is your book? Yeah. Yeah. And you can imagine yeah. the Hindu saying, well, you know, what, what We've got a book. Yeah, yeah, it kind of works, right? Yeah, it's two protagonists, and you know, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So yeah, then yeah. They, All right, then we'll at take this that. Point, yeah. At this point, yeah. from both sides, I think, from the colonial side, sort of, but it would have been the pundits first that sort of brought forth the Gita as a sort of an appropriate kind of conversational partner 
with these okay. Western way of thinking. So the pundits would have been Vedantins. They brought forth, and then the, 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 then the British sort of, you know, in the beginning, they even called it the Bible of India. And it's the first book to be translated in your know, 17, whatever it is, 88 by Wilkins. So then it takes on this status, and that filters back down in India in the modern period, post-colonial period, where then more and more Indians start to think of it that way. And now it's sort of, and then when the good, big gurus came over in the 60s, they all, you know, this was our Gita, you know, that was our, that's our kind of like national. So then it takes on this kind of new uh, status and presence, which wouldn't have been quite as strong prior mm. colonialization. It would have been a text in circulation, but only the Brahmins and, and Vedantins would have read it, mostly. The people on the ground will be reading Ramayana and Mahabharata and, right. and you know, vernacular versions of the stories and the Puranas. Right. They wouldn't be reading these sutras and the, and the Gita's kind of, you know, it's philosophically fairly dense. Mm, mm. So the True enough. Mm. Yeah. We're cramming a lot in here, aren't we? As fast yeah, as we're just trying to kind of jump around. I'm jumping all over the place. I'm sorry, a little bit, but I'm just, I've got a lot of questions I want to ask you. So I want another, another idea. Um, is there any possibility we can read any kind of Advaita stuff in the Gita? I mean, or is it just my translation? Because at certain points, Krishna says, you know, I am the creation. I am the great, I am the gambling of the cheats and the, well, I don't know what he says, the drunkenness of the drunks. You know, I am everything, right? Like everything is the sacred play of me. Is there any kind of Advaita-esque stuff in it? Well, I, I, okay, but Advaita makes three, let's just go with three statements. Like one, the world is unreal. And there's nothing in the Gita that suggests at all that the world is unreal. You really have to super, you really have to, you know, force that onto the Gita. The second, you know, major statement of Advaita is that the souls are, you know, merge into Brahman. There's yeah. not much of that. Krishna says, Mame Vanksha Jiva Loke, they're my Anksha's. Yeah. And, um, yeah. And the third, I, thing, I in them, not them in me. I mean, there's a specific yeah. part where right? he says, I am in, you know, yeah. And then the other thing is that Brahman is impersonal, that, you know, ultimately Ishwar is also an illusion. Ultimately, there's nothing to that effect in the Gita. So I think Advaita really has to work very hard. Now, having said that, there are a couple of verses where, you know, the, the, the term union with me is expressed. And obviously Advaita would understand that union is an absolute union, a merger, or, you know, where you, there, you know, whereas the Vaishnavas would understand that a union in love. But there are a couple of verses that do, you know, are sort of, that can be more easily interpreted by Advaita. I think Advaita has a better time with the Upanishads, <laughs> the Brihadaranyaka and the Chandogya. But even there, nowhere does it say the world is unreal. But nonetheless, I think the, uh, I think it's, uh, the Upanishads a little bit easier for Shankara, not the Vedanta Sutra. I think anyone who objectively studies Vedanta, it's, it's some kind of a difference in oneness. It's some kind of a Beda, Beda type text. It's mm. not a, a radical Advaita. So Advaita's got an, a, a disproportionate amount of attention. And I think that's because of some of the, the great nationalists, you know, Vivekananda, Vivekananda and, 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 uh, and Swami Shivananda, mm. you know, because of their presence. That it's got an extra, you know, an extraordinary amount of, of attention in sort of um, in, in the Hinduism that came over to the West, but I don't. I, I Gita is not is not you know a a Dwaita kind of uh, friendly text. It's not something that lends itself to a Dwaita at all. Much more a kind of a Ramanuja, or a Madhva, or a kind of a you know, there's a oneness there, but with just, just the real world, a real God who's a personal being. I mean, Krishna is clear. Brahmanohi Pratishtaham, you know, Brahman is founded on me. I am the supreme. I am the source. I mean, you have to work really, really hard to try to, you know, ne negotiate, negotiate your way out of that. Um, <laughs> what so, about Bhakti? As a Bhakti in yourself, what about Bhakti in the text? How is Bhakti? I mean, can, is there other, more than one way to interpret that, that thrust in the text? Or is it, you know? Bhakti is, is Krishna says, throughout surrender to me i mean the we were talking about the end right man mana bhava mad bhakto fix your mind on me become my devotee the very very mm. end Adyaji, sacrifice to me mm. so I, I i don't know how i don't know what to say it's, it's it, you know i am a bhakta so i suppose people will turn around and say well you're a bhakta and that's why you think that way yeah does it inspire you the text does it has it does it right 
I don't see how you could read the text any. It's so obvious and clear and blatant. I mean, the Upanishads, I understand. Well, yeah, no I suppose, could, yeah, there's a different kind of sacrifice, isn't there, I suppose? Because at one point he says, well, you can do it by diet or you can do it by, you know, breath, right? Or, or ritual. So maybe that's where the, the Bhakti, well, you know. There he's talking about just sacrifice. He's saying everybody, all beings have to sacrifice. So then he gets that whole section about the different kinds of sacrifice, but he concludes it by saying, therefore, you know, I mean, the only way to be in the world is through sacrifice. But then he then he goes on to say, well, sacrifice to me, I am, the, you know, the, I am the Lord of sacrifice. And, the, you know, then he then he then he presents himself as the ultimate object of sacrifice. But in all those verses about sacri some sacrifice of breath, some sacrifice of fruits of action, some mm. you know, that's all this just establishing that sacrifice is non-negotiable in some form of fashion. But then he goes on to say, well, since it's non-negotiable, the highest thing you can do with this non-negotiable reality of sacrifice is to sacrifice to me. Mm. It's so clear. I, don't, I mean, really, honestly, Adam, I, I mean, the, the Upanishads, I understand how they, you know, because the Upanishads are not systematic. They're not clear. They say one thing here, another thing there. I suppose because people don't want to devote. I think there's the, you know, the, I mean, you know, I think kind of Jude Christian, the, you know, kind of religion has really, has really uh, made that rather unfashionable these days, you know, think, it's put devotion and sacrifice and, you know, and this kind of attitude, you know, which we, which we were, we know we're living under for so many years, I think but it's, it's not a popular idea anymore. So the advisor thing is, you know, it's, you know, it, it seems to preserve more autonomy for the person, but um. I agree with you but, completely. You know, yeah, the, um, the is not in right. It's not cool these days. It's oh. not cool. I mean, but you know, on that level, I mean, practically speaking, I mean, how how would someone use this text then? You know, um, and and I always think, what about this idea of duty? Like, do your duty and don't do another's duty. I mean, how the hell are we meant to know our duty these days? At that time, it was really bloody clear. Like, you know, yeah. you're a warrior, you do that stuff, right? Like, you kill people, you know? You know? But now, in this, how is someone practically, you know, our audience, going to use the Gita? No, it's not, it's not helpful for that, because, right. as you said, back then, first of all, it was assumed, you know, pretty most people, you know, your, the family you were brought, born into would be the product of your karma. So you pretty much end up, as it was all over the world, right, even in England 200 years ago, if your dad was a farmer, you were a farmer. That was it, you know, I mean, before industrialization. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. But you, so that was part. But but the Gita doesn't say that you're born into a caste by birth. It says, guna karma samud baba, right? Devi Hiyasha, no, he says, um, chatur varna maya shristam. I created the chatur, the, the four varnas, guna karma, in accordance with guna, your nature, and your karma. So, uh, but, but your question is how, so, so back then you knew what your dharma was because you look, you read the dharma sutras and you, you're, do you need to wrap this up? No. Oh, I thought you were speaking. <laughs> Hey, you're so yeah, you're so quick. You're looking. I was just looking, kind of looking at adjuncts to that same question. Carry on. Sorry. Really quickly. Yeah, yeah. So we don't have yeah. any method of knowing, you know, simplistically what our dharma is. So if we just go with guna karma, I, I would just say this, and this is me, right? We don't have Krishna. Mm. This is how you identify your dharma. I don't know any text that does that. Any pre-modern text. Uh, the assumption was, you know, you do you know your dharma. Yeah, it's you quite clear. Dharma, mm, and then mm, you mm. have a problem, you read the dharma sutras. But mm. I would just say for us, it it would be what is it that is your basic your nature? What comes naturally and effortlessly? Whether you do it with success or not is irrelevant. But what is it that when you do, and it should be something that's been with you your whole life. It's not some great idea. Oh, oh Lord, how about we do this? How about we do that? Right? Mm. Some idea comes in two weeks later you you know you've forgotten it got some other idea something that's always been with you you know you're the sort of person that is an activist in the kids in the playground you'd stick up for that you you know you'd fight the bully and stick up for or are you you know you are you trading football cards and making a <laughs> making a couple of you know making a bob here and a bob there is that or are you into a nerd and you know or would you like working with your hands in the carpentry shop where you love that best part of the week when you get to get, you know, so that it begins to manifest right from the beginning. Mm. And our problem, of course, is from the point of view of the Gita's, we're all mixed. Remember the beginning of the Gita? 
Well, one of the reasons Arjuna doesn't want to fight the war is because then all the, everyone gets killed. Then there'll be mixture of castes. Yes. Yeah. And nobody yeah. knows what to do. So yeah. That's, that's yeah. basically us. So we're in a state of perpetual confusion because we might have a bit of Brahmin, a bit of Chhatri, right. right. everything going on. But I would nonetheless say there should be, or there could be, or, or hopefully if we're lucky, there is a dominant sort of thing that we have always oriented ourselves around that comes naturally that is ple- that is you know sat- that, that we feel at peace with that makes us feel a little calm and sattvic when we're engaging mm. in a particular kind of activity that would be our dharma mm. and, and it shouldn't be sort of social pressure like okay do this because you make a lot of money or do this because it's socially prestigious we have to go into a place of sat for bracket all of that bracket where our well-meaning parents would r- rather like us to do and just really go deep and say, what is it I've always wanted to do? Because it mm. should be lurking about, even though we may have this mixed kind of, the gunas are mixed, they're not as clearly defined as is idealized in the Gita. Gita has this idealized sense that everyone's gunas are going to be relatively coherent. Even though yeah. even the Gita says, you know, sometimes sattva is dominant, sometimes rajas, even the Gita recognizes the gunas. But I think it's talking about on a day-to-day basis. But in overall, we should be we should have these prominent gunas, according to the Gita, which um, feel comfortable doing a certain type of activity. Someone and also, is yeah, I'm someone sorry, comfortable working with yeah. their hands, and they yeah. love. Or in a dance studio, and when they're there, that that's the best place for them. Someone else likes to make money. He's always looking at things in terms of how how much could I make? I could buy this here, sell it there. He's always thinking. How much is that worth? How much is this person worth? How much money is that in that? He's just thinking that way. And a Brahmin a type is intellectual and more sort of look probing for causes. And, you know, so we, we, I think we have these natures. And, and if we can just identify them and find an occupation that fits around that, then we, you know, we won't be enlightened, but at least we'll be a bit peaceful and a bit sort of content in, in our bodies, not just in our bodies, but in our social, in our social body, in our social spheres. And then I think, to, and then I think to find that you you still have that strong kind of Patanjalian idea of control your senses, right? Control your wish for pleasure, right? I mean, there's I a there's a huh? I cut, that cuts. I'm sorry, I interrupted you. Go ahead. No, not at all. No, I was just going to say like you find that kind of like delayed gratification idea, right? Like first that pleasure that's like poison, right? That gradually becomes like nectar, and right, you know, and that tamasic pleasure that I love as well as like bad at the start and then bad at the end as well like don't do that like yeah poison at the end it's like why the fuck would you do that right tamas. um tamas yes yeah like tamas it. yeah yeah but um you know so there's this strong idea that you know like that comes kind of cuts across as you were saying all, all yoga right which is like sensory control in order yeah. to find yeah. that intuitive understanding of what yeah. you are and what you want to do right rather than follow oh now i'm you know that seems attractive and i'm pleasurable i'll do that and then jump across here do that right which is you know interesting in the current age which is so quick yeah. and wants immediate pleasure yeah but, but i I'm, I'm i would put it this way there are two different body two different discourses one is what your right. dharma is. that's your dharma and the yoga is, is going to be a tiny, only a small percentage of people would be doing yoga. So Dharma is what 99% of the population is doing. They're not necessarily yogis. And Krishna says, don't disrupt their minds. Just have them do their Dharma. Don't start talking about too much intense yoga because that's not going to upset their minds. Better they do their Dharma dharmically, even with attachment to the fruit. So the first thing we were discussing is how do you know your Dharma just in a mundane, forget about yoga. Right. Um, am I a teacher? Am I a, a, a sort of activist warrior type? Am I a business minded sort of person? Do I like to work with my body and my hands? That's a separate thing. Now, on another level, there's yoga, which is what you're talking about, giving up the objects of the senses, all of that tapas. And then karma yoga then blends those two. So whether you're a Brahmana or a Kshatriya or a Vaisha or a Sudra, you can still be a yogi. If you follow yoga, the principles, which is giving up attachment to the fruits and then and the, and the rest of it. Right. So you, you, basically, that's what it is, giving up all attachment to the fruits and just doing your duty with no desire. That's karma yoga it doesn't talk mm. about Ajaya, it doesn't talk about anything else, but it does talk about bhakti. And then, you know, once you're, you're then if you if then if you do that, you'll get your Atman. If you do your Dharma 
without any attachment to the fruit, you will reach the same goal as the yogis, the Atman. Bhakti is seeking a higher goal, not just the Atman, it's seeking Bhagavan. So that's a whole other discourse again. So you've got just a regular Dharma discourse, you've got a regular yoga as- Levels, levels. Um, well, the, yeah, the- Levels, Rasprim. Gita of hierarchy, hierarchy. You, you quoted the verse, fix your mind on me. If you can't do that, then, you know, what then if you can't do yeah. that, we'll give up the fruit to it. And then Gyan is at the bottom of that list, if you notice, 12th chapter. So let's, let's think about it for a minute in three different ways. One, okay, just do your Dharma, better than not doing Dharma. And then, then yeah. civic, order, <laughs> civic order is maintained, society yeah. is yeah. maybe we'll do your Vedic sacrifices, gods will give you rain. Right, then you've got yoga, which can either be forest and, and you renounce Dharma, and he, Krishna says, okay, but there's another one, second one, where you graft yoga and Dharma, and that's Karma Yoga. The Gita is the first place that really, really talks about this. You might find the odd reference here and there in the, in the Mahabharata, but it's really the first place where this power, hmm. powerful new kind of yoga comes out. Uh, but just Karma Yoga by itself takes you to the Atman. Not, right? Then, if you're interested in Bhagavan as a higher truth beyond the Atman, as the Gita will present Bhagavan, then you have to do that Karma Yoga as an offering and bhakti and offer it all. And then you're fixing your mind on God exclusively. Then it becomes bhakti. So it looks complicated, but <laughs> you know, if you really study it, and it takes many years for it all to sort of sink into place, there is an utter coherence about it in the entire text. There's an utter coherence and a sequence, and you know, and and different options are provided. Mm, mm. What about I mean, was it really the first text to mention karma yoga as a path? Yeah. Yeah, I think so there's, there's no, no precedent before that. Yeah, for yoga. A, there may be a line here and there. I think there's a line in the Upanishad I remember reading about giving up the fruits. Mm -hmm. Moksha Dharma it, it, uh, of the Mahabharata is, another, is a place you, you'll find the, uh, the origins of everything, actually. You find the origins of Vedanta, of Sankhya, and Yoga. In the Moksha Dharma, it's an old section of the Mahabharata which hasn't received enough scholarly or even yogic attention you know svadhyaya attention it's, a, it's an amazing section it's just not very systematic in it you know but yeah the gita is the first place where you get this very coherent powerful you know that becomes universalized possibility of doing yoga while acting in the world it's the first place it comes across in a strong coherent systematic fashion i'm not saying you don't find the odd line here and there before that yeah the yeah yeah first place that it really is presented in a in that in such a powerful you know way that then becomes you know that really influences the entire in, in indian textual tradition and the gita does you know certainly by the clone does it well it does you know even before that vedanta you know picks it up and it becomes one of the three vedanta texts and vedanta has always been you know the you know one of it's always been a very influential but again all of these traditions let's remember a Brahmin caste exclusive traditions. The study of the Upanishads, the study of the Vedanta Sutras, all of that up until colonialism and modernity would have been in a, a Brahmin preserve, the, not, which is 1% or whatever it is, I don't know, but tiny, right? Mm. The 99, I'm making up a number, 99% mm. of the population would be reading the Puranas, the stories of the Puranas, the story of the Ramayana, the story of the Mahabharata, if not in Sanskrit, they'd be reading it in vernacular, in vernacular renditions, in poetry, in whatever mod modality filters down into their particular communities. So all of this we're talking about, Vedanta and Yoga Sutras, up until modernity, and really up until the 60s, really, really, when it becomes totally universalized, but really, it's an exclusive, you know, male, like we have our wasps, right? White Anglo-Saxon <laughs> Protestants. They have their, you know, brown, brown Brahmin, you know, whatever you want to call that. I made up a term once, wasps and the bees. Yeah. You know, <laughs> it, it, anyway, so... You, so everyone else is just doing just, just pure devotional kind of bhakti, everyone, really, right? Everyone's doing bhakti. Everyone else is yeah. doing bhakti. Whether it's yeah. the Shiva or Shakti or Ganesh or you know, they're all doing bhakti. But then the sadhus, there's a precedent of yoga, like, and we're talking happy yoga in the in the sadhu communities, right? I mean, that seems to be 
a st- like they, he's talking in the text like people know what, what what he's talking about when he's talking about sitting your seat in the forest and you're you know and your spine straight etc right yeah, but I, I i'm not sure why we would call that hutter uh adam because there's no okay. hutter, there's no hutter in patanjali there's no kundalini okay. you know the hutter is the force that awakens the kundalini hut means okay. force that is force a, yeah force there are shakta yeah. traditions the Gita is not, the, when it's talking about asana and chapter six and straight in the spine, it's talking Patanjali. Patanjali is not Kundalini. There's nothing in Patanjali about waking the Kundalini and having it rise up through the chakras. None of that whatsoever. So you know, Hatha, Hatha is, you, I mean, this is a side point really, but Hatha you say is, that terminology is exclusively bound up with Kundalini, you think? It is, yes. It's always, you think it's always stuck like, together. You, you could talk to Jim Mallinson about that. I'd be, I'd be interested oh, yeah. in his point yeah. of view. Yeah. But yeah, we can tell him, according to Edwin Bryant, the Hatha, <laughs> is, that term Hatha yeah. is... Is is the always kundalini. about the force of Kundalini? Right, right. So it's not so. So saying it's hatha is to, is ta- just simply tapas is is to to is not enough. Is you know to undermine the the the, what, what the term. In other words, the Patanjali tradition is a chitta in or older tradition is not a kundalini. kundalini. Yeah, yeah, tantric. Yes, yeah. there's a reference to a yeah. chakra. But it's not part of the process. It's not part of the. Of the uh, of the ashta anga or the kriya or any of it, so I, so I wouldn't merge the two. I would say that Hatha appropriates Patanjalian methods. Of course, it does. So does Bhakti. Everybody appropriates Patanjali. Is just a a kind of a, a method. Mm-hmm. But I wouldn't conflate the two because there are there are many Chittavritti Naroda traditions, but were Patanjali specific that are not nothing to do with Kundalini. A lot, you know, the Bhagavatam has got nothing to do with Kundalini. It recognizes the chakras. It mentions it here or there, but not in the slightest bit relevant to the, the, the practice. Yeah, yeah. that's, we that's another, it, was it another conversation even, wasn't it? Yeah. Well, what does asana, what's asana used for? Is it, is it tantric or is it ascetic? You know? Well, in the Gita, it's yeah. just, it's stiram asana. You just sit. So yeah. Because you you've got to fix the mind. So what are you going to do with the body? The mind's in the body. Is there any mysticism or, or esoteric practices in the Gita? Because there's one point that really confuses me, and I reckon it's in 10 or something. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to probably bloody find it now. But what he says, you know, that those people in the practicing like this in the, the, the six months of the northern sun and, you know, that yeah. part, right? Yeah. And they go there and then those people go there. I mean, that's pretty, pretty opaque. What, what are, what's going on there? What, what that is, 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 is that's the Brihadaranyaka Upanishad. Right. So the Brihad Aranyaka and actually two Upanishads, uh, maybe the uh, maybe the Taitariya or, or the Chandogya, I can't remember the second one. There's two, when you die, you, you die, there's these two, you know, if you go in the sun and in the, in the, in the fortnight of the, you know, the, the, wane, the waxing moon. And the, yeah, exactly. Yeah, that oh, one. That, yeah. that yeah. It, I don't know how that fits into the Gita, because so that seems to be an old Vedic model, which is kind of... Pr- before reincarnation becomes this, because reincarnation is about your karma, not about when yeah. you die in the light. So it seems to me you've got an old Vedic model, which is kind of closer to the Greco-Roman, Indo-European model. And then you have this reincarnation model, and it's not at all clear how, I have to read the commentaries there. I have to, I, you know, I, I, haven't got, I haven't got to that page. Mm. Looking forward to reading the commentaries. Whether anybody notices that this is quite discordant with reincarnation theory and karma theory, where hmm. it doesn't matter when you die, it's all cause and effect. So I think you know historians are going to make a good point here that you've got two models sort of grafted, one sort of inherited from the Brihadaranyaka being grafted onto this later model, and it's not at all clear how they fit. So that's just for me, that's an aberration. I haven't studied the commentaries on it yet. Uh, when I do, I'll, I'll get back to you and see if they try to reconcile it. But my presently, for me, that's a discordant couple of mm. verses at the end of one. Yeah, day. right. Yeah, yeah. It's obscure. I mean, there definitely there's this constant thing of fix on fix your mind on me when you die, right? I mean, that's and that's you know that has a clear precedent, right? You know, the last thing you think of, there you'll be reincarnated in that manner. So you know, he does say that a great deal, right? You know, fix your mind on me. I think there's one chapter almost it starts off, and a lot of it's about that, right? Last thought and concentrate on me, right? So those yeah. who and they'll go to Brahma. 
come come to me so then I mean, is it also transcendental is, is the is the is the idea to involve oneself in the world finally finally or is it to involve oneself in leaving the world and going to the going to be with krishna on, on you know coming well, to the, come to me it's so cherry logical the gita is about moksha it's about liberation mm, it's about, mm. it's about coming back next life it's about you know being liberated but you can do it by doing your civic duty in this one life. You don't want to come back to another life. So in that sense, it's but so definitely cool. like, yeah, right. It's, but it's definitely so kind of. It, it's so terrible. Yeah, it's so teriological. Its intention is moksha and bhakti, but you can attain it in this life since you're in it. Since you're embodied, then you can attain it by doing your civic duty. So you, you know you don't run away from the world. You do your duty. But the grand, the goal of it, it's a moksha shastra. It's a moksha shastra. There are moksha shastras, dharma shastras, you know, karma shastras. There's all kinds of shastras. Gita is a moksha shastra as well as a dharma shastra, but it's joined the two together in karma yoga. It's really hard to get to really put all this together in 45 minutes, Adam. <laughs> it's it's so well, I've enjoyed it. <laughs> and we can hope our listenership and our, our viewership well, we will too. That's what yeah, I would we, recommend to your readership. Yeah, yeah. Uh, study the Gita and read uh, the commentaries from both sides. The Advaita side, you know, you can read, you know, Shankara, if, if it, although it's a little bit ancient and archaic, and Ramanuja, which is a century later. If you what want about to- a little bit more modern stuff. Well, in that case, read the Shivananda one for Advaita and read the Bhaktivedanta Swami one for the for the uh, Bhakti, the, the Vaishnava one, right? Because you have basically two streams, which obviously subdivide into multiple streams. But you basically have the sort of Dwaita, Neo-Advaita kind of, you know, and I would go with Shivananda for that. Because he was a wonder, he was a great, you know, and I, I have a lot of respect for Shivananda hmm. and Advaita. And then for the Bhakti one, if you want something that's, you know, that's comprehensible to us without that, you know, decades of background study, then read Bhaktivedanta Swami, the Hare Krishna movement one for a good sense of what a bhakti interpretation looks like. That's what I advise readers to do. Excellent. Get both good. Of them. And if I may just add, yeah, if you have, a, if you're serious about study, get Winthrop Sargent's, that Sargent with S-A-R-G-E-A-N-T, not quite spelt like the Sergeant Major with an E in the middle, Get his SUNY, State University of New York Press, the one with the Sanskrit. Be careful you don't get the abridged one because that is just a translation and he gives you every single word, the grammatical, so you can see even without knowing Sanskrit, you can get as close as you possibly can to okay. the original text. Read that, then read your Shivananda, then read your Bhaktivedanta and make your own informed position. Yeah. Which one is closer to the actual text itself? Uh, that's a good. That's a good uh, place to part company for today, Adam. What do you think? I think I think that's great. As a Winthrop Sergeant, I shall get that now because yeah. I mean, if you don't if you don't know the Sanskrit and you kind of need to know the words, yeah. right? You know, yeah. Then um, yeah, I would recommend I everyone to buy it. I can I can send you the whole things. I have it all scanned. Well, send me the thing, and then anyone else yeah, listening, probably, I'll send you on the thing. Probably- yeah, but it's the sort of thing you want sitting on your shelf, if I may, if I may be so. Well, I'll get it. Of course, I'll get it. Yeah, yeah. Someone like your father, you're, you're really interested in all this stuff. I think I am rather interested have... in it. You know, yeah, <laughs> it's not just a facade. <laughs> well, it's been wonderful to talk to you, and um, yeah, I mean, and I hope people enjoy this, and um, and thank you again. <laughs> all right, all right. Cheers, mate. All right. Have a good day. <laughs> it's uh, you too. Bye yeah. now. Bye. 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 Bye.